Hey there, everyone. My name is Benji, and I'd like to welcome you on this beautiful evening to Plus Life. We're a church that exists to see lives changed by the gospel. Thanks so much for tuning in and spending part of your weekend with us. Now, I don't know about you, but this past week has been pretty hot out there. You know, it's patio season and people are out and about again. Uh, just a reminder to stay safe if you are deciding to uh, be outdoors. If this is your first time with us tonight, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you. We're so glad to have you with us. We've designed the service tonight with you in mind. In just a few moments, we'll sing a few songs and then we'll hear a message from Elder Joel continuing our series, The Solas. I can't wait. In all, you can expect our service to be no more than an hour and a half. Now, if you'd like for us to get to know you a little bit better, please fill out an online connection card found in the description of this video. Again, thank you for coming tonight and we hope you have a great time at ch church. Uh, before we get into worship, let's just open up with a word of prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity that you've enabled us as a church to tune in from all across the city and gather uh, together for this time of worship. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. We thank you for purchasing uh, our salvation, for redeeming us, and for calling us your own. God, I pray um, as we enter into a time of worship, uh, will you fill our hearts with praises unto your name. And then, Lord, I pray uh, for your servant tonight who is bringing forth your word. Would they be an instrument of peace tonight? We pray for life change to happen and that um, through your word, uh, people would be touched and people would not be uh, the same way they, as they listened in. God, I pray uh, that you would continue to speak to us and stir in us a motivation to live out your gospel. Uh, I pray that tonight uh, you would sow a seed in the hearts of many, and that you would continue to grow that work in us, Lord. Lord, we also remember our tithes and offerings. We pray for those who have stretched forth their hands in giving to this church. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless them in that area, that they would be able to give more and more. Um, Lord, then as a church, I pray that we would be able to steward um, our resources that come in and that we would be able to extend your kingdom here on this earth and to proclaim your gospel to the ends of this city. Uh, Lord, we uh, just remember this time and, and we lift all these things into your throne of grace. May you be exalted tonight and may you be glorified. We ask all these things knowing that you go before us and that you'll have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let's enter into a time of worship, church.
church. I am so thankful to the Lord for his providence. Uh, because of him, we get to meet online despite COVID. Uh, but I must emphasize that this is not normal, uh, nor will it ever be normal uh, for us believers. 
Rest assured, the leadership and their teams are working together to get ourselves ready to come back. And uh, we are eagerly excited to meet together soon. So please keep the church and the teams uh, in prayer for a successful reopening of our church uh, and our physical location so that we can all meet together as one family. And now please take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we will be reading from verse 1 all the way to verse 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, that you've gathered us here tonight together online to hear from your word. God, now we are praying that your spirit would open our spiritual eyes and ears to understand the truth of your word. And we are praying, oh God, that you would be honored in all that we uh, do in our hearts tonight. We pray, oh Lord Jesus, that we will leave a people that is changed by the word of God, uh, renewed in our mind and inspired in our hearts. And God, would you enable me to speak the truth with clarity and that I will only be your instrument of peace. May your grace rest upon us now. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. We are in the third week of our The Solas series, a series that aims to encapsulate the foundations of the Christian faith, whereby we can distinguish truth from error. We can weed out the false gospels and dogmas that either stand in opposition to or confuse or um, diminish the parameters of the biblical gospel. In week one, we covered how sola scriptura, scripture alone, is our final authority for all things pertaining to faith and life, and that it is timelessly relevant for all people. And out of the God-inspired, inerrant, and infallible scriptures, we can obtain the truth of God and his revelation. We saw in week two how solus Christus, Christ alone, is the very image of God in the scriptures that shows that outside of Christ, there is no salvation. Christ is the fork in the road where everyone must either suffer down the narrow path for salvation or fearlessly sin down the wide path for judgment. And tonight, we will look at the third sola of the Reformation. The title of my sermon is Sola Gratia which translates to, by grace alone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That is what we will see tonight from Ephesians chapter 2. We will also survey passages, both in the Old and New Testaments, which will help us articulate this doctrine and see its importance. Why grace alone, sola gratia, which was, was imperative in the Reformation, and still retains its primacy. In fact, the gospel we preach from the pulpit and ought to preach and cherish and share with people around the world is called the gospel of grace. But before we digest this doctrine, Paul, in the opening verses of chapter 2, reminds us of our spiritual condition before we got saved. 
And this is crucial. This is crucial for us to know so that we can understand the tremendous impact of God's grace in our spiritual life, and namely salvation. He begins verse 1 of chapter 2 by saying, And you, speaking to us, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. So let's pause right there. Paul first reminds us that before we were saved, we were spiritually dead. We were spiritually dead. What does it mean to be spiritually dead? Scripture uses many images to communicate our salvation, our, our pre-salvation condition. But in its most simplest terms, to be spiritually dead is to be separated from God. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned against God by disobeying God's clear and good instruction, he became spiritually dead for God. And and, and God said that on the day he shall eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he shall surely die. The Garden of Eden is where the presence of God dwelt with Adam and his wife. But because of Adam's sin, he was banished by God and kicked out of the garden. He was excommunicated from the holy presence of God. And the Apostle Paul fleshes out this idea even further in Romans chapter 5 by saying that Adam, as our representative, our representative, the father of the human race, took all of us, his children, into that state of spiritual death as well. So it doesn't matter if you have been born into a Christian home, you will still be spiritually dead as long as we are a child of Adam. Every person, regardless of where one is born and brought up in the world, is spiritually dead. Every sinner is separated, separated from God because of being born as a child of Adam. We were truly separated from God before our salvation. And a living reality of this, as per Paul in Romans, is physical death. Physical death. And Adam died spiritually, yes, and one day physically, because sin entered the world through his disobedience. And that is why all of us still experience the passing away of people in our lives. So babies, children, youth, teenagers, adults, and seniors. We will all die one day. Everyone has an expiration date because of the sin that we inherit from our first parent, Adam, at birth. Every time a person gives up their final breath, it should remind us that sin caused all of this. Sin causes death, and worse, spiritual death. And being reminded of this, we must ask ourselves, was it possible for us us spiritually dead people to reach the presence of God and be in paradise with God when we were spiritually dead, like Adam. And the Bible says no sinners, no, like no, no way, no sinners. Sinners cannot do anything to be with God in their spiritually dead state. There was no way for us to reconcile and be right with God or do anything spiritual because by nature we were spiritually dead. And in verse 2 and verse 3, Paul says, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So Paul, again, reminds us that before we got saved, not only were we spiritually dead, we didn't even care. We didn't even care that we were dead. We were sinfully tainted. We were sinfully tainted. People are not sinners because they lie or hate or kill. People lie, hate, and kill because they are sinners. It's a very big difference. You never have to teach a child to be selfish. Never. Ever, ever. You never have to teach a child to be selfish. And if the parents don't 
correct selfishness in the child, eventually that selfishness will continue to grow and manifest on some level like not sharing their toys. And if the child is not kept in check, that selfishness will continue to grow and grow and it would be no surprise, it would be no surprise if that child became an adult who is very selfish in their marriage. So while the degree of selfishness in marriage is much more severe than a child crying, my toys, the, the essence or nature in both, in both the child and the adult is still selfishness. It is still sin. And sin, by the way, sin, by the way, affected our entire being. Romans chapter 8 verse 7 to 8 says that the mind which is in the flesh is sin or in sin is hostile to God meaning there is no person there is no person in history who is neutral before God there is no person who is neutral before God if you are not for Jesus Christ then you are against him there is no neutral ground about that there is no middle ground and the natural disposition of the sinner is to be against God to be hostile to God as per the Bible. Romans 1 also clearly articulates how sinners, people, are naturally bent towards perversions of in their affections and desires. John chapter 8 verse 34 says that even the will, our choosing, the will of the natural man, a person who is not a Christian, is bound as a slave to sin. Whoever sins is a slave to sin. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 said that out of the heart, out of the heart comes evil, wicked thoughts. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 says that the natural person is not even able to understand the spiritual things about God. So the Bible is emphatically clear that the natural man or the child of Adam is really sinfully tainted in all their faculties. When we see the brokenness in the world, we have to make sure, we have to make sure that our conversations focus on the root cause of that brokenness, namely sin. We cannot just preach on how to fix broken marriages. We have to preach on how to kill the sin that caused the broken marriage. We cannot just ex accept that good people do bad things sometimes. We have to see that people are sinful and that's why people actually do bad and sinful things. The only reason people aren't as bad as they could be is because God is restraining the sinfulness in the world through the personal conscience, uh, the family, so mom and dad, and the civil government. I cannot drive, I cannot drive at 100 kilometers an hour on a 60 zone, even if I want to do, because I fear the cops that God has placed over my life. I cannot eat all the cookies I want because I fear my wife that God has blessed me with. So brothers and sisters, we were all broken before we were saved because we loved to sin. That was the real problem. We were slaves to sin. We did what we thought was right. We lived in our own desires outside of God. Outside of God, we chose to partake in that truth. Uh, we were not even able to understand spiritual things. Sin affected every part of our being. We were sinfully tainted in every way. So again, we must ask ourselves, was it possible for us to seek God, let alone choose God and love God when we were sinfully tainted in our desires, in our thoughts, and in our will? The Bible says, no, we would not choose God left to ourselves. In fact, we couldn't even understand anything about God before we were saved. The Bible also clearly says that sinners are not seeking God. They're not seeking God there because they're against him. They may be seeking the benefits of God, like wanting a better marriage, a better community, love and peace, but not God in Christ himself. That's why we are told to go to them. We are told to go to them and share the gospel because they won't come to us for the gospel on their own. 
Church, before we were saved, before we were saved, we did not want to do anything with God. Romans 3 verse 11 says, no one seeks after God. We were really hostile to God in our heart. We were really hostile to God in our will, in our choosing, in our mind, in every area of life. So not only were we spiritually dead, but we were also sinfully tainted. And not only were we sinfully tainted, but we were also truly condemned. We were truly condemned. Verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and pay attention to this, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Were by nature children of wrath. Before we were saved, we were sinners by nature. By nature, it was a natural thing for us to just do bad things and sin and grow in our sin if we were not kept in check. And sinners will sin, like we said earlier, by nature. And Romans chapter 6 says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And Romans chapter 2 verse 5 says that because of the stubbornness and an unrepentant heart, people are storing up. They're literally storing up God's wrath against themselves on the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, before we got saved, we were once truly condemned. We were really a child of wrath, of God's coming wrath. And had we not been saved, had we not been saved, our destiny would be condemnation by God, where God would pour out his justice, his wrath against all evil, and we would have had to bear the weight of our sin and evil. My friend, let me speak directly to you who does not trust in Christ for salvation and is listening to this message. You stand condemned right now before God because you are a sinner and you sin. God who is pure and holy will not ignore the sin in your life. A man who escapes the gaze of the Holy One does not exist nor can exist. For the Bible says in God we live and move and have our being. So literally impossible to hide or escape from God. But, but if you trust, if you put your trust in Jesus to have paid for your sins and satisfy God's anger and wrath against your own sinfulness, you will be saved. So I, I really plead with you to be saved tonight. God is near to you and he does not desire for you to die in your sins. So recognize, my friend, recognize your situation before God who is holy and trust in Jesus. Church, Paul just reminded us that before we were saved, we were spiritually dead and cut off from the presence of the Lord. We were sinfully tainted in every way, and we were truly condemned to receive the wrath of God on the day of judgment. These verses conclusively show our hopeless, sinful state. And what we really need right now is hope. What we really need right now is hope. We need hope, church. And Paul knows and feels this too. He knows that we are hopeless on our own. And so he begins verse 4 with the most stunning, shocking, amazing, thrilling, wondrous, hopeful two words. But... God. My brothers and sisters, my friends, you will never ever hear anything sweeter than this. You will never ever amass anything in value that compares to this. You will never ever experience anything more exceptional than this. You will never ever come across anything better than this. But God. 
God intervenes to give hope for the hopeless. And so begins the gospel of grace. Praise God. Praise God. So verse 4, let's, let's see what verse 4 says. It, it says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. So let's pause right there. Our first hope is to know that God's grace alone changes our destiny. Grace alone changes our destiny. Just before this, we were reminded from verse 3 that sinners are truly condemned and were by nature children of wrath. But when Paul says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, it should draw our attention back to what Paul already said in Ephesians chapter 1. So let's see what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 to 6 says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Dear ones, you were once a child of God's wrath, but God had already decided in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, that you will be a child of God's love. For in love, God predestined you for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to his purpose, his will, uh, not your parents' will, not your family's will, not the local church's will, and definitely not your own will, but his will, his will, so that he can glorify himself for his graciousness. You had zero contribution in your election by God for salvation. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 through 30 says this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You were predestined for salvation because God first foreknew you. God foreknew you. And the word foreknow here in Romans does not simply mean uh, foresight in the sense that God knew what you would do. And upon that basis, he decided to predestine you. No, God did not choose you to be saved because he knew you will have faith in him one day. No, that's, that's not how it works. Please hear me. The object being foreknown in this Romans verse is not your action or your faith or your will or your ability in life or your decision about the gospel message, but it is you, the person. God foreknew you as a person, those whom he foreknew. So Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says that before God formed Jeremiah in his mother's womb, God knew Jeremiah. God knew Jeremiah and already consecrated him and set him apart uh, for uh, being a prophet to the nations. The idea of God knowing someone isn't simply knowing them as part of his all knowledge or omniscience, but instead the idea communicates a special kind of knowing, a purpose, a will from God. And we see this in Amos chapter 3 verse 2, and God says this about Israel. He says, you only have I known out of all the families on the earth. Well, Obviously, it cannot mean that God only knew about Israel. It cannot mean that and not about Egypt or the neighboring countries. No, because God knows all the families on the earth, all the nations on the, on the earth, because he is God. He knows everything. But there was some special different kind of knowing from God for Israel and not for Egypt. I know all of you in the church. I know all of you in the church, but I know my wife differently than I know all of you in the church. And Paul also mentions this in passing in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, when he says, but if anyone loves God, so if you love God, if anyone loves God, 
He is known by God. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 7 to 8 says that God chose Israel out of all the nations in the world because the Lord what? Thought that Israel was great? No, God chose Israel out of all the nations because he loved Israel and wanted to keep his oath or promise to Israel's ancestors, namely Abraham. When Paul mentions this in passing, he's not simply saying that God knew you in his omniscience. He's saying that God knew you in a special way. To be known by God. So to be known by God is to be loved by God. Or in our context of Romans chapter 8 verse 29 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. To be foreknown by God is to be foreloved. Foreloved by God. A common verse we see in uh, wedding cards, right? 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. The verse is saying that Christians love each other because God loved the Christian first. But I want to suggest that this love God has for the Christian did not start at the cross 2,000 some years ago. It began in the heart of God. It began in the heart of God before, before the foundation of the world was laid. That's why in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, it says, in love, in love he predestined us. So God has loved you, brothers and sisters, from a very, 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 very long time ago. Our destiny is no longer to be a child of wrath, like it says in verse 3 of Ephesians 2. But because of God's foreknowing, predestined to no longer be a child of wrath, but instead be adopted children of God. And God foreknowing you results in a covenantal, personal love, just like he loved Israel from all the other nations, which again, like Israel, you did not initiate or contribute to achieve, but rather God, because of his great mercy, decided in eternity past, like it says in the Romans chapter 9, verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I have decided to have mercy on you despite your sin, my son, my daughter, for the praise of my glorious grace. The debate around predestination views that many times reduces to how God can hate Esau in Romans chapter 9. He has a special love for some people and hates people like Esau. And I'm always astonished when that becomes the crux of our conversations about predestination, considering we don't, we really don't deserve anything but hatred and wrath from God since we were God-haters and in open rebellion against the king of the universe whenever we lied to hide something from our parents, stole intellectual property like movies and music and software by downloading torrents, uh, or murdered others in our hearts by hating them, or cheated on exams and assignments, gossip, envied, and the rest. We saw this earlier. We were reminded earlier that sinners are spiritually dead, sinfully tainted, and truly condemned before God. So I would suggest, I would suggest the question we ought to ask ourselves is this, how can a holy God, how can a holy God who cannot tolerate any sin, any sin, love Jacob? How can God love you? The question isn't why does God uh, not share his mercy and grace equally to every single person in history, like Pharaoh and the Amalekites and the rest of the world today? Well, for one, it is God's prerogative to share if he wants to share his mercy. And two, uh, again, the question that must baffle us is why did God decide to pour out his mercy and upon us believers and love us from before the foundation of the world when we are no different? We are no different, no different, at least in our hearts, at least in our hearts than Pharaoh or Goliath or Judas Iscariot the betrayer, or Emperor Nero, or Hitler? And the answer to that question is grace and grace alone. Brothers and sisters, ask yourselves, is there any area in your life you think that credits you to be known by God? Maybe it is your service uh, to the church. God knows you will be a good servant, and so you had good potential to be a Christian. 
Or maybe it's your Christian heritage and lineage. Everyone in your family is saved and in ministry, so it is kind of obvious for God to save you also. Do you sometimes feel that God loves you more some days and less other days because how well you read the Bible or how long you prayed or how much you served the church without complaining? If so, you believe in your heart, you may not say, but you believe in your heart, the mercy and grace of God is tied or dependent on your performance. And I'm not talking about our day-to-day -day fellowship with God. I'm talking about our relationship with God, your position before God, your status before God. And let me tell you, the moment you put any qualifier any qualifier in front of grace, it is no longer grace alone. The moment you say that God chose you because he knew in his omniscience that you would say yes to him in the, when the gospel is presented to you, it no longer is grace alone. Family of God, God deeply loves you and made an everlasting covenant with you individually in Christ. And his sovereign, his sovereign will is to make you like Jesus. And he had this plan before you were even born or could do anything good or bad. And you aren't chosen by God because of anything you did do or will do. Your future is bright not because of your choices in life, your future is safe because of God's grace and grace alone. It is true. Sinners are born condemned before God, children of wrath. But God's grace alone changes our future. God's grace alone decides our destiny. And thank God, None of us get a say in that because we would undoubtedly remain the children of wrath. By grace and grace alone. Let's return to our main passage now. But God, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our second great hope is that God's grace alone makes us alive. Grace alone makes us alive. Paul begins chapter 2 with the deadness of men our moral incapacity to do good for God or even understand God, like we saw earlier. Deadness is to mean truly dead. And Paul in verse 5 begins to explain what happens to us because of God's plan to save us. He begins to show grace in action. And that is when a sinner is born again or regenerated. So today in many churches, well-meaning churches, regeneration or being born again has become the end result of having faith in Christ. So it would be common to hear the preacher at the end of the message say something like, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be born again. However, that language is not seen in the scripture. Rather, what we see in Acts chapter 16, for example, is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And this is where the late theologian R.C. Sproul said what all Reformed thinkers believe about this. At the heart of Reformed theology, this axiom resounds. Regeneration precedes faith. Your faith comes after you are born again. It's the opposite. And so, and this is exactly what I mean when I say that grace alone makes us alive. Regeneration precedes faith. Faith comes after being born again. So look at our text. Paul could have just said, you know, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That would have been a good flow of thought. But instead, Paul intentionally breaks his flow of thought by inserting, by grace you have been saved, right after he says, being made alive together with Christ. So, 
we need to treat that break with the same intentionality. When I say grace alone makes us alive, theologically, I mean regeneration. So being born again is an act of God alone, where God raises the spiritually dead sinner to new life in Christ. And the new saint in Christ naturally responds in faith. The sinner naturally sins and the Christian will naturally respond in faith. To be even more precise, the Bible consistently teaches both in the Old and New Testaments that there is nothing you can do to be born again. Nothing. Being born again is not dependent on your cooperation to believe in Jesus. And let me show you why our church plus life holds to this doctrine so tightly. In John chapter 3, Jesus talks about being born again uh, to a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus obviously asked, Teacher, uh, how can a man be born when he's old? Right? It's a, it's a good question to ask. And can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus responds saying that unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, born of water and the Spirit. Now, Jesus was not talking about water baptism or a natural physical birth when he mentions water. Okay? He wasn't talking about that. When Jesus mentions being born of water and Spirit and then scolds Nicodemus for not understanding what he meant, considering that Nicodemus was an Old Testament teacher himself, it only verifies that Jesus was indeed referring to the instances where water and spirit are mentioned together in the Old Testament, namely the promise of the new covenant. So let's go now to the Old Testament where we see this. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24 through 28. I will take from you the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause, cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So here we see in Ezekiel, God promising to sprinkle clean water on the people of Israel to cleanse them from their sins and give them a new heart, a new spirit, a his spirit. His spirit within them to cause them, to cause them to walk in his way so that they will be his people. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 also talks about God writing the law of God, writing the law of God in their, in their hearts so that they will be his people and how in this new covenant he will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more and they will walk in his ways. So keep these Old Testament promises in mind. And now let's come back to the New Testament. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. And he, this is Jesus, took bread. He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. As Jesus establishes the Lord's table, which we follow today, he's symbolically drawing attention to the bread and the wine. The bread symbolizes his body that was given up for us, and the cup symbolizes his blood that was shed for us. And this is key, brothers and sisters. Jesus says that his cup that is being poured, meaning his suffering, his death on the cross, his shed blood, will be the means by which the new covenant promised in the Old Testament will be fulfilled. And the death of Jesus was not just for the Jews. 
but also for the Gentiles, meaning the new covenant promises where God said he will clean the people from their sins and put his spirit in them so that they will be his people and obey him was not just for or not just obtained by Jesus's blood for Israel, but also the whole world. Titus chapter three, verse five says, he saved us, God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Paul here is saying God regenerated us, not because of any works done in righteousness, which includes faith, which includes faith, since faith is a righteous thing to do before God, as per Hebrews 11, verse 6. Instead, we are regenerated, born again, only according to the mercy of God, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, by water and spirit here again. The point I'm making, church, is that to be born again, to be born of water and spirit, is the new covenant promise which Christ purchased with his own blood. The water signifies that you and I are cleansed from our sins, and the spirit signifies that we have a new nature. We no longer have a sinful nature, we have a new nature. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 8, that to be born again is like the wind. It's like the wind. You don't have control over the wind. You cannot direct where the wind blows. You cannot tell where the wind comes from. The wind just blows. And so it is with everyone who becomes born again. Dear ones, the wind picture here is to show you that you were not instrumental or even a cooperative piece to your own regeneration. When Nicodemus was asking, how do I become born again? Jesus was saying, it's not up to you. It's up to the wind that blows wherever it blows. You just don't know. It happens to people. So faith in Jesus is there. So faith in Jesus is there. But believing, having faith in Jesus happens as a result of your born again experience. Faith in Jesus happens as the result of finally seeing Finally seeing the truth that you are a sinner before a holy God and so you need Jesus for salvation. Faith is the instrument, the means by which grace is applied to your life. And the only reason you are no longer blind is because God healed your blindness first. The only reason you are no longer lost but found is because God sought you first. The only reason you are no longer dead in your trespasses and sin is because God made you alive first. First, the only reason you even care and understand about the things of God to repent is because God put his spirit in you and gave you a new heart to desire him first. And God didn't take your permission or wait for your decision to make you born again. He is like the wind. He miraculously and graciously resurrected you from the dead and all of that is by grace alone for by grace not your effort not your decision not your will but by grace alone god's grace alone you became born again in fact like we were reminded earlier right in your sinful state where everything is affected by sin how would you ever say yes to, the, to, to Jesus and deny yourself and carry your cross. You wouldn't because you wouldn't want to do that. No sinner wants to deny themselves, carry the cross for the sake of Christ. But God found you, resurrected you, opened your eyes, enabled your mind, gave you a new desire, wrote his law in your heart so that you will say, yes, I, I want to deny myself and follow Jesus. God made you born again so that you will have faith in him. If God didn't take anyone's permission to create the universe, nor take our own permission for us to be born into this physical world, what right do we have to participate in the decision-making uh, by God in making us spiritually alive and enter his kingdom to create a new nature in us? We don't. We are his workmanship. It is 
all grace and grace alone. Paul was very intentional when he broke the flow of his writing, when he says, by grace you have been saved, right after, but God made you alive. So brothers and sisters, ask yourselves, can you feel, can you feel the weight of trying to convert someone? Just go off your shoulder now? Your job has never been, and it's not your job to convert people and have their eyes somehow open to the truth, but only to evangelize the truth, the gospel. It is God's job. It is God's job to make someone born again and cause them to believe in him through your preaching because being born again is a resurrection, a miracle which none of us can do. So be bold, be strengthened, be encouraged to go share the gospel unashamedly to everyone because God, if he has determined to save people, he will accomplish it. You know, uh, we often hear uh, analogies of the sinner who is drowning in the sea uh, of sin and all he needs is for someone to throw a lifeline so that he can grab it and come back onto the ship for safety. I find that to be a misconstrued representation of who sinners are and by what and what God does in regeneration. I would suggest the best picture is what we already see in the Bible and what we see in Ezekiel chapter 37. And I'm going to paraphrase this. The Lord brings a messenger. The Lord brings a messenger to a valley of dead bones. And he instructs the messenger to prophesy his word over the valley of dead bones. And as the messenger prophesied the word of the Lord, there was a sound, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And he saw the flesh begin to appear and the skin begin to cover them. And the Lord instructed the messenger to prophesy again. And as the messenger continued to prophesy the word of the Lord, the sovereign Lord commanded the four winds to breathe into the dead. And behold, breath entered them. What once was a valley of dead bones was now a vast army. And God said to the messenger, Tell the people of Israel that just like this, I will raise them from the grave and put my spirit within them, and so they shall live. Brothers and sisters, you were once that valley of dead bones. And then one day, one glorious day, God sent his messenger to your valley to preach the gospel of grace. And behold, as the gospel was being proclaimed to you, the valley, the sovereign Lord summoned you saying, Lazarus, come forth. And immediately the wind of God, the Holy Spirit, breathed new life into you. And for the first time ever, you took your first spiritual breath. And your spiritual eyes opened and your mind was spiritually enlightened. You looked around and saw your surrounding. You smelled the stench in the air and understood where you were. And immediately for the sake of your spiritual life and well-being, you stood up and ran out of that grave. Church, you are no longer dead in your sins and trespass, trespasses because you were made alive by grace and grace alone. God resurrected you from your spiritually dead self first. And then you naturally put your hand up for prayer asking, hey, I need Jesus because I don't think I am right with God. That is all because of God and not you. That is grace and grace alone. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, man, is there anything we bring to the table for our salvation, like anything at all? And you may be tempted. You may be tempted to answer that by saying, yes, our faith in Jesus, our trust in Jesus, our obedience to the cause of Christ. That is something we bring to the table for our salvation, right? 
Well, let's finish the rest of our main passage and see what Paul says. So verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Church, our third and final great hope is that God's grace alone gives us faith. Grace alone gives us faith. Brothers and sisters, don't assume that your believing in Jesus, your trust in God, your obedience to the Lord is something that originates with you or in you. Don't assume faith in Jesus or the act of believing, trusting and obeying in Jesus is something that already exists in every person in the world. And, and so everyone has the capacity to have faith in Jesus Christ and sinners are just not exercising it. Rather, as it says in verse 8, it is the gift of God and not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What is the gift Paul is referring to? Okay, all of it. All of it is a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith. All of that is a gift from God. Not just the grace, not just the salvation part, but even faith itself. All of that is the gift of God, and it does not, especially faith, originate with you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, we have to run. We have to endure the race that is set before us. We have to work hard to fight sin and love Jesus. We are held responsible to endure. But we must not assume that our faith to do these things begins and endures with us. We must instead understand that Jesus himself is the founder and perfecter of our faith. We are not the author or originator of our believing in Christ. It is Jesus himself who authors our faith to believe in God. It is Jesus himself who's making sure that you keep believing every day you wake up. Yes, you believe, you run, you endure, but your willingness to believe, your strength to run, your heart to endure is all authored by Jesus and sustained, perfected by Jesus. Again, it is all grace and grace alone. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but I, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This is Paul speaking. So Paul is saying that we should not think of ourselves more highly than anyone else in the church because God himself distributed to each one of us in the church a measure of faith. And Paul began that instruction on the grounds of the grace that was given him. So do you see what the Bible says about your personal faith in Jesus? Faith is a gift from God distributed to each one of us with a certain measure by God and then sustained by God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 to 13. I, I got to keep going. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Dear ones, you are responsible to pray, to study the word, to love and serve your family and the church and obey Christ. You are supposed to work out your salvation. Not work for your salvation, work out your salvation. But remember, the only reason you pray, the only reason you keep praying every day, the only reason you decided to not watch Netflix and instead study the Bible, the only reason you've decided to contribute financially to the church generously, the only reason you decided to be self-sacrificial and love your spouse, 
The only reason you desire and want to obey Christ every day is because God is already working in you both to desire those things and then actually do them for God. This is fundamental in the way we think about faith because the moment we believe that faith is something that we bring to the table, something we conjure up with our own strength or are the author and captain of, we have added to the gift of God. And we will start to think of faith uh, something that anyone can have. And the slippery, slippery slope is to no longer see Jesus as the very author, perfecter, and object of our faith. Jeremiah 32 verse 40 says that God will make an everlasting covenant by putting the fear of God in the hearts of his people so that they may not turn from God, so they will endure. Many years later, like we saw earlier, at the right time, Jesus came and shed his blood to purchase, to purchase this new and everlasting covenant for his people. So in short, the new covenant includes your endurance in this lifetime. And the next, the new covenant, your enduring faith, and this enduring saving faith was obtained with Jesus' blood. The Bible says, the Bible says when God sends his word, it, it won't return to him void. When God sent Jesus the word, Jesus did not fail to accomplish the will of the Father. And the will of God was for Jesus to establish the new covenant, which included enduring faith or saving faith with his blood. Jesus shed his blood to establish the new covenant that includes faith and cried out saying, it is finished. Now, we must ask ourselves, is it possible for a true believer to fall away from enduring, saving, real faith which Christ obtained with his own blood? No, dear ones, no, no. It is not your performance that sustains your faith, but the shed blood of Christ that established the new covenant. That is why we can echo Paul when he says in Romans that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is why we can echo when he says in Philippians that God who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. That is why we can echo Jude and praise God who will keep us from stumbling and present us before his glorious presence one day without fault and with great joy. Brothers and sisters, when you go through tough times, pray to God to get faith, more faith from God. Pray that God will give you the strength, give you the grace, give you the endurance in times of adversity because he sent his son to purchase your enduring faith, your endurance. Pray for your unbelieving family and friends to have faith in God. Why? Because only God can give faith to unbelievers. It has always been grace, dear ones. It has always been and for, will forever be by grace and grace alone. We were once spiritually dead, but God's grace made us alive. We were once spiritually tainted, sinfully tainted, but God's grace alone gave us faith. We were once truly condemned, but God's grace alone changed our destiny. A diamond's brilliance shines most clearly against a black velvet cloth, and likewise the grace of God against the sinful plight of men. So let me close by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, and this is Paul speaking. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. May we also be like Paul and always, always, boast in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and say, by the grace of God alone, I am what I am. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you God for this time that you've given us to be in your presence, to hear from your word, and to 
chew on your truth. And so, God, we are praying now, will your Holy Spirit convict us? Will your Holy Spirit remind us that everything that we do to the glory of Christ in this lifetime, everything, our faith, our willingness, our heart's desire, all of it is by grace and grace alone. Lord, teach us to never compromise these truths. Help us to always remember that you have loved us even before we were even born. And God, help us to see that you sent your son Jesus to accomplish our salvation, to, to get us the new covenant which has our faith so that we will believe on that day and so God you will present us Lord Jesus perfect and holy in your presence so God help us to cherish these truths Lord it is by your grace and grace alone help us always to remember that it is an amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like us so God have mercy on us continue to continue to be with us may your grace rest upon us and we ask this in the name of your son Jesus amen and amen. Let's worship.
Father, we thank you, God, for this time that you've given us to be in your presence. We thank you, God, that you are so good and you're so marvelous. We thank you, God, that you are so gracious to us, even while we were sinners. You sent your son Jesus to die for us. You loved us before time began. It is grace and grace alone. Oh God in heaven, we are praying that as we uh, go forward with the rest of our week, that we will always remember that we are who we are because of the grace of God. And anything good we do in this life for the sake of Christ is because Christ is working in and through us. You're the spirit of Christ is in us and ensuring that we will be successful in our faith to God. And so God, we are praying, will you give us endurance this week? Will you give us the strength to endure when times get tough, when things are not going well at home or in our relationships or in our circumstances God help us to set our eyes on the object of our faith Jesus Christ help us to remember that you are there for us and that you have never left us and that you are with us and so God we pray that your presence continue to be with us Lord God we pray we will never compromise the gospel of grace help us to cherish the gospel of grace Lord give us the strength and the boldness to speak this gospel to all people knowing that God those whom you determined and elected to be saved they will be saved through our preaching our poor preaching our poor sharing Lord it doesn't matter we thank you God it, it doesn't matter how how we say things or what we say but ultimately it has to be the gospel that is shared so that people will hear and be changed and so God we're praying give us the strength Give us the strength to share the gospel to our families and friends. And God, as, as brothers and sisters, as a family of God, Lord, help us to be grounded in the gospel of grace. Help us to always remember that everything that we have, everything in faith that we have has been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, which was planned by you, Father, and, and which was empowered and given to us by your Spirit that is within us. And so, God, we are praying that we will never forget that, God, it is all you it has never been us teach us to humble ourselves so that we can receive more grace oh god in heaven we thank you that you're so kind and you're so good protect us keep us in the faith and help us to endure for the sake of christ we love you father that you hear our prayers and we ask this in the name of your son jesus amen well church thank you for joining online and um, being a part of our service make sure that you ponder on these truths and you pray to the Lord daily and you study the word and we, we are excited to see you again next week as we continue our series and until then remember that God has always loved you since forever and so go knowing that you are loved loved God bless